a big part of my job is working with uh, Save the Children offices all around the world, helping them work with their own local media and, 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 and work on various kinds of projects. But I guess one struggle for me constantly is telling what we consider to be like development world issues or stories to a developing world audience. So I'm very keen to hear what you guys heard back from ETV, from MTV in the Middle East, um, what kinds of audiences you got, what kinds of stories worked well in various uh, media markets, and, and, and just talk, to, if you could talk around that a little bit, I'd be really interested. Um, yeah. <laughs> yes, the, it, it would appear that when you're, the, the statistics are not really available, but you, it's better to use short films with some audiences, that's very obvious in you know what you call the South. Um, it seems to me that the the same criteria apply that I was talking about. The more people put into showing the films, the more they got out of it. So ETV were very successful on their Pan African channel, but because the showing coincided with um, it's the moment of the year when they they had their advertising sweeps or whatever in South Africa. They didn't do so well in South Africa. These are, these are, I'm afraid, explanations that have to do with the nature of broadcasting rather than anything more grand. Um, the films are extraordinarily successful in Hong Kong, Taiwan, and Japan, um, where in different ways the audiences really got behind them, the broadcasters got behind them and pushed them. They were less successful in Australia where only, I think, four of the films were shown, and ABC was rather so laggardly, uh, not so good at dealing with them. So I, I think you can say that it, um, it, it depends where. Obviously, in the outreach, these films are a resource available, not just through the Open University, but educationally for the next five, six years. They can be updated, they can be cut into small films, they can be used in 10-minute segments or whatever. And we really hope we're working on this now to get them out to as many, many people in the South as possible. So they'll have a very long life. And maybe you can help us. Maybe if there are ways that you know of getting these films seen by more people all over the world, you should be telling us that. In fact, anyone from NGOs now should be advising us, this tiny organization of ours, what to do with these films, how to make them perform, what, uh, what information to build around them, what programs to have around them. And we do have some money to help you. And we can tell you how to raise more money to make more of these films. Um, also, um, just the last two questions were around, you know, poverty over there. And I think one of the things that this series does do is actually reflect that poverty is not just over there. You know, one of the films in particular, Park Avenue, which is my personal favorite, um, is, <laughs> I have many favorites, but that's one of them. Um, I think that one reflects, you know, the, the inequality and poverty that exists in the United States. And even, you know, Welcome to the World or Forborn Every Every Second also does that. So I think um, I think this is a, a, a key point in the series. Joe, you had a question? Um, tell us who you are. And Joe Hanlon from the Open University and a journalist. It's really a question of how we get the BBC and other media to look at positive anti-poverty stories. I'm currently doing a book, I'm a journalist as well, I'm currently doing a book on Bangladesh climate change. And of course, the collapse of this building in Bangladesh with a thousand deaths is a huge story. The current cyclone which is going through Bangladesh at the very moment isn't killing anyone. That is a bigger story. It isn't killing anyone because they have the most spectacularly good early warning system and have built a climate shelter system that protects people. Bangladesh did this itself, largely without mm -hmm. an aid industry. Nobody tells that story because Bangladesh did it itself. Nobody from here in the north is promoting anyone to pick up that story. So it's the classic story, big cyclone, no one dies, so no one cares. And it does seem to me that we, if we can get some of these positive stories, we're also talking about how poverty has changed because Bangladesh it may not be able to get proper buildings built, but it does save people from cyclones. So we do get some successes, and we should talk more about those successes. I, I, yeah, I, I'd like to open this up to the panel as well. So Lenny, do you want to start? 
I mean, just very quickly, I think Joe's absolutely right that we need to get better at talking about not only positive stories, but actually about the agency and the change that is happening around the world. From our research, looking at public opinion here in the UK, I think the overwhelming perspective people feel they get, and I think it, you know, it reflects a lot of things, it reflects a lot of the campaign that happens around humanitarian crises, for example, which often resonate in people's imagination, but they have this overwhelming sense of sort of doom and disaster in developing countries and a relatively sort of two-dimensional understanding of what the lives of, of sort of those in those countries are. And actually, when we did this work with UK citizens around the country, all of the groups said to us, you know, we're never told about actually how change happens. And that's what we want to understand. We're told aid, you know, total amount of spending and inputs a bit of the outputs, maybe X number of children now go to school as a result. We're told nothing about what happens in between and about the processes and all of the different things which are going to have to come together to make, to make change happen, which is not often an aid story. Um, and I think, I think often what I see in the development field is people say, well, we know that that's just too hard and it's too complex to communicate. You know, how could we possibly tell a story to our publics? about all of these different things that need to come together. Um, but I think Simon, actually, and there's mm. copies of his report in the room, sort of shows us that in other areas of public policy, UK citizens already understand and engage with the complexities that exist. Um, um, so there, I think there is a way forward that we just haven't tapped into yet. That does sound like a good moment for me. <laughs> Thanks. So we're talking about how you engage the British public in a debate about poverty and development. And it matters because we have a place in the world, but it also matters because we're spending taxpayers' money. Um, and the argument might go that we're not spending taxpayers' money as efficient as we, as we could be because the debate is skewed in the UK. And um, I, my background is in development, 15 years in kind of global governance. Um, and I've now moved into kind of democracy in the UK, away from development. And I've learned some things in doing that that I wanted to bring back into this world and so we just finished the research report that's on your um, on your chairs there and I wanted to particularly just to note Lani and Brendan who are co-authors there um, with me I'm not going to wave they're looking too embarrassed mm -hmm. um, so I, wa I want to tell you a story about science I want to tell you a story about the complexity of science um, and about the challenges of engaging the public and the fear that experts have of engaging the public in complexity and I'll leave you to draw your own conclusions I will kind of highlight them a little bit about aid um, I want to talk to you about genetic modif modified crops. Um, this is an area where the experts, the scientists and government largely believe this has many benefits for, for us as citizens. It will lower costs of food, it will give us greater food security, deliver hay, uh, health benefits, vitamin A for example in rice, big benefits for the economy, but consumers in the EU won't accept it. And in fact, there have only been three products authorised for, for growth in, uh, commercial growth in the EU since the, the technology first took off in 83. It offers us these big benefits, and yet we're resistant to it. Why is that? One model is what, what the, the, the science technology world calls a deficit model, and I think this is something that the aid world really needs to understand, this model. The reason the public doesn't accept GM is because they're scared of the risk to their health. If we tell them enough times and enough, in enough complexity that it's not bad for their health, then they will accept it. The trouble is what that misses is that GM isn't just about health. In fact, it's not about health at all. It's about who controls the technology, who benefits, who is it, is it going to be developed in a way that, that gives monopoly or in a way that benefits more people commercially. Um, uh, how are these benefits going to be spread? Are they going to be held in a, in a small group of people or, or, um, or, or spread more widely, more equitably? Is it really dealing with a problem that whether we have a big social need or is it not? Is this about killer genes so Monsanto can keep hold of the market or is this act genuinely about a social need? And a whole set of other things. This isn't about the science, it's about the impact of the science on the world. The argument runs though that science is too difficult, too complex, epigenetics, ribosomes, RNA, the public can't possibly understand all those sorts of things. It just isn't the case because actually as I said it's not about the science, it's about the impact of the science on the world. One very quick story. Chimeras are mythical animals from uh, classical Greece. They're mixtures of different, different animals, um, lions on, on, uh, on poultry's head or, or poultry body or whatever they are. And it's a new technology. The use of hybrid uh, animal-human cells um, is, is allowing uh, scientists to explore all sorts of really interesting things about disease and many other things. But it raises significant ethical concerns. It's a heavily complex area of science. 
And the HFEA, the Human, Fertiliser Human and Embryology Fertilisation Authority, wants to explore what the public thought about it. Um, and they did a big public engagement dialogue that was some of this kind of broadcast stuff, along with some actual, actually big deliberative dialogue involving a small number of people, about 100 people. Department of Health wasn't willing to authorise experiments in this area because they thought the public didn't want them. The dialogue, the specifically the, the deliberative dialogue, told them actually the public had a much more nuanced view. The public was interested in the benefits this might give if appropriate safeguards were, to, were put in place, and so the policy was changed. And I would argue you can look at all sorts of places where DFID is worried the public won't accept the way we want to deliver aid, and so they don't do it. And if they actually engage the public in a more adult way, they will be able to change the policy because they'd understand what it is the public is really worried about. Because we're making a whole series of trade-offs. There isn't one answer, um, as Nick said, to poverty. There's a whole series of trade-offs we have to make, particularly with the tiny amount of money that DFID spends. And how we spend that will impact on our place in the world, and it will impact on the way the effectiveness of aid. And basically, I think we, British government, NGOs, are lying to the public about how simple it is to deliver development and aid. We have to stop lying. We have to start telling the complexity. And what I think this story tells is you can reach a mass audience, but how do you then engage in a deliberative way? And I think that the work that we do in science and technology shows one way that you can do it. We really, really must do it in a different way. Thank you, Simon. Um, Mark, you've, um, you've done work at IBT on audience reception and you know the complexities and I think it might be an interesting time to just kind of talk a little bit about that. Well I think several people have mentioned that you know the way in which um, development issues are reported uh, and there's a big obstacle that most of people's uh, information comes from news mm. and charity appeals like comic mm -hmm. relief so we in the charity sector have a big responsibility to think about how we communicate uh, and I think there is significant research that shows an appetite for a more intelligent um, messaging from NGOs. Um, but there's a clear conflict uh, between the marketers and the c communicators because simple messaging, uh, you know, s it's got the guy from Save the Children, your, your, your TV campaign, um, but, you know, um, is just incredibly successful at pulling at the heartstrings and bringing the cash in. So no one at Save the Children is going to want to abandon that. But the power of those images makes it a real obstacle for people wanting to find out more. It just, it just puts them off. So we, we need to, it's back to, do we leave television alone or do we engage with it? We, we need to put a lot of energy, uh, and, and uh, Joe makes a very interesting point about, you know, you're a journalist, I know you're an academic, you're a journalist too, you're writing journalistic stories. Uh, if we understand what motivates and interests of journalists and we talk to journalists, um, we have to work very hard to persuade them and they're open to persuasion uh, to, in the news, widen the range of reporting. I think the direction of travel for news, which no one's mentioned, is, is a big worry. The, the fact that all, all mainstream TV news is reporting fewer stories and the 24 our news cycle, lots and lots of minute moves on the story of the day, one big foreign story of the day. Louise, you're nodding. It's impossible to get news broadcasters to widen the range of stories that they, they, that they, they cover. And, you know, Bangladesh for a moment was the news, the international news story of the day. But somehow we didn't see anyone then digging in the way that we would have expected. Everyone said, well, what are the causes? Uh, but I, I didn't see any really thought through pieces on the causes. So I think we need to engage uh, with TV much more, actually. Uh, and, and, you know, I'll go back to Nick. I think it's very brave saying I'm going to tackle this he he head on. Um, but we need, I agree with Paddy's point, we need somehow to pressure the broadcast so that when Nick goes to his bosses, they say, yeah, we're going to, we're going to, clear the schedules on BBC One and we're going to spend the whole evening doing this instead of only doing that for comic relief. Thank you, Mark. Um, I know there are lots of questions. I've seen lots of hands up and um, if you could introduce yourself and, and speak into the mic, please. 
Hi, Sue Bishop, um, freelancing currently um, many years at the BBC and in NGOs. Um, I'd like to go back to a kind of practical point and, and pick up um, Nick's point about how we're all going to get our heads together and do this better next time. Um, and specifically on that, about um, the online kind of strategy and plan around promoting all of this material, all these great films and so on and so forth, because there's been a lot of conversation, of course, about um, broadcast platforms and how we're going to get people to see the films. Fine. Um, but I'm really interested to know what BBC Apart, actually, what the plan was in the consortium for, you know, really promoting this stuff online, getting small little bits of shareable content from it onto the platforms where people are actually existing online, um, you know, whether it's Tumblr for younger people or whether it's Mumsnet or whatever it is, you know, getting um, a real voice, you know, uh, an iconic figure to represent all of this and getting them to be connecting with people on a one-to-one, -one. but all of that kind of stuff. I'd be interested to know what the plan was around that, how successful you think that aspect was, and how we can do it better next time, because I'm seeing a gap, but I, I may not have seen it all. I'm going to take a couple of questions, I think, um, if, the, if the panelists can remember what the questions are. Yes. Over here. Yeah, well, the mic. Sorry. Yeah. Hi, hello. Yeah. Hi, Hi. Show Kono from uh, Restless Development, where we're experimenting with a storytelling program for British members of the public who've had a overseas volunteering experience. Could you speak up a little bit? Sorry, that's okay. Just so people uh, can hear you. I mean, I, I'd, ag I'd agree with uh, not being too hypercritical about the uh, series, especially considering if you take off the UK perspective, it ha it does seem to have quite a lot of an impact, but. If we're talking about what lessons we're supposed to take away from it, what's the balance between the sort of the content side of it and the and the distribution? You know, it, obviously they're both important, but where do we have most catching up to do? Is it on the sort of getting a better message in various ways that Mark and Lenny were talking about, or is it in the reaching the unconverted through you know not just hoping that each national public service broadcaster in each country bestows a prime time slot upon us, but some of the more sort of tactical things, like we're in the uh, slide about uh, screenings at schools and factories, or, or the online strategy, that sort of thing. Which which, which is more urgently sort of uh, behind the behind the curve? Okay, thank you. And I did see some questions down here. The woman in the green. Hi, I'm Dorothy Arn from Hand in Hand International. I uh, was really chuckling about the comparison um, between NGOs and the electric fence, um, and I wondered if we could have a few tips on how we as NGOs can be better partners to work with rather than um, the electric fence. Thank you, Dorothy. Um, it's three questions, right? Three questions. Do you, is it just a question? Uh, Wait, 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 wait. <laughs> Into the microphone. This is please. probably one for the audience. Um, I'm Catherine Kelleher, and I've been doing the social media for Why Poverty. What I found the difference between NGOs in this country picking up on the broadcast of these documentaries, especially you know, especially ones around tax, land grabs, um, maternal health, was so different to the rest of Europe that I want to know what is different about NGOs, especially aid agencies in this country, to even like Action Aid in Sweden and Norway, took the Twibbon, the Why Poverty Twibbon. I couldn't get a retweet from Action Aid UK. I couldn't even get a follow from them. So that's <laughs> the culture. I want to know the cultural difference and why. And that's to the floor. Mm. Mm. Okay. Um, is brief responses from here and then we can have more questions. Well, mine's, I, mine's almost a question <laughs> rather than a, so you Sue were talking about kind of how do we broadcast this better. I, I'm interested in the extent to which any attempt to, was made to engage with the questions that people were raising on Twitter and other forums and the extent to which they might inform future programming uh, and even the extent to which they get got fed back to and were picked up by NGOs or DFID or others. So to what extent was the debate that was happening around the programs actually one that was just another kind of a, a conversation that was like two ships in the night or was there really a genuine conversation um, between lots of different parties? Um, I, I can't answer these questions, I'll take up too much time. 
I want to answer the NGOs one. I want to lump it in with um, what you were saying earlier about positive stories. I mean, it's very simple. The NGOs, in your mind, you have to separate off the glories of reporting and the obligations of campaigning. They have to be separate in your mind. And you, what you really have to do is to get behind the ferried Zakaria position. Like, you have to encourage people to do good reporting. And by good reporting, I, I, I think this division of things into good stories and negative stories is a load of bollocks. I think that essentially any reporter, any reporter who's any good is just interested in how things are. I don't see why we can't have stories from Bangladesh on the 10 o'clock news. I'm sure we can. I watch the 10 o'clock news the whole time. I listen to BBC Radio. And actually, there are quite a lot of these very well-reported stories on BBC Radio. We just need more of them. And um, if NGOs get behind the idea there's only one worthwhile form of reporting, and that's good reporting, then I think, you know, over a period of time, the quality of understanding of what you call aid or development, all these things, will improve enormously, and that's what we really need. Thank you, Nick. Levy? Um, a couple of quick uh, reflections, I and mean, I think that Nick is right. We have to try to separate out the sort of the providing a more um, accurate picture about what the realities are around the development processes and dealing with the complexities that Simon um, has talked about from the campaigning um, side. But I think the challenge for us here in the UK is at the moment there isn't much incentive for organisations to separate those. And in reality, the campaigning and the fundraising imperatives continue to be the strongest. And I think that's partly because they continue to work. Um, we have a number of you know, large NGOs in this country which con are continuing to raise money from this model. I think there is a, um, there's a research challenge there for us to build up a better evidence base that actually if you move away from that model, you'll still be able to bring in your revenue, and we, we're not able to show that. But I know from the work I've been doing with a number of the big NGOs in this country in, um, over the last year, that also their own market research internally is starting to pick up a questioning that people are now raising about, well, why are you still coming to us to ask us for money for a problem that shouldn't you have sort of sorted by now? So I think, I think it's, again, I get think about that kind of the short-term imperatives that we have and the longer-term effects on the climate of public opinion and, and whether that balance is going to start to shift um, um, going forward. But I think it will take... Um, it will take some adjustments within agencies um, to really ta tackle that head on. I mean, from my perspective, thinking about the question from the front here, what's more important, the content or the distribution? I mean, I think both obviously need to come together. I imagine if you're the, the producer of a series, distribution it might be where you want to focus more on, right? Because it's about the reach of your, um, um, of your particular series from my mind and trying to look across the climate of public opinion, I think we have to start changing the content of how we're communicating. And we have to start changing the, the, the substance of how we engage with our publics at home. Because I think, you know, we see a steadily declining support. I think at some point it could well fall off a cliff if we don't take this, um, this seriously um, and start to act now. Mike? Um, yeah, I too liked uh, your, your question. Um, I think we need we, we, we need to think more strategically uh, if we're involved in TV projects about making a lot of noise um, and having something that people can genuinely interact with. And I think the long form documentary uh, is good at engaging a particular audience, um, but it's not necessarily the right vehicle to make noise and get talked about. So if you were designing the next um, Why Poverty from scratch, you'd have some long-form documentaries, but you'd have, a st you'd have Paul Mason on Newsnight, you'd have a, have a story on Today, you'd have a panorama, uh, you'd, ha you, you'd have a drama. I mean, Mary and Martha was a, it, you know, almost a, a blueprint of how to do it, making a lot of noise, getting, getting celebs to pr watch a preview and tweet about it, 
in interviews with Richard Curtis, a drama, a drama engages a different, different audience. People start watching, not necessarily wanting to find out about how serious malaria is as a problem, but by the end of it, my God, they're really engaged with the issue. So, so I think you need a mix of programming, not just the documentary. You need news, you need radio, you need drama, you, 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 you need entertainment, um, and, and, and you need a network. <laughs> Uh, and it's you know it's it's that's where I think um, someone asked I think you over there how how we as NGOs talk to journalists. Actually, I think that NGOs are very sophisticated nowadays at pitching stories to journalists, and we run a lot of events where NGO media officers can meet the editor of Panorama, the editor of Newsnight, etc., and pitch those ideas. But it's then uh, the follow-up and working together. Uh, uh, you know, and, uh, uh, and, and I thought Catherine's comment about she couldn't get a retweet from ActionAid. I don't oh know if no, this. I, I picked that one as it, it was A. You know, it was all of them above. <laughs> 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 Basically, B. Uh, was yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, you so know, I think we're that's not, very we're interesting because the NGOs <laughs> ha ha have, have this huge <laughs> network. And, and Nick's offer that all these programs are there, take them, use them. Uh, but uh, uh, clearly we need to work on that relationship. The offer is there, how are we gonna take up that offer? I mean, you're at Restless Development with all your youngsters. I'm sure you, know, you could show them the films, run off thousands of DVDs, they can go and whatever plans you have. That's an injection of creativity and imagination. Uh, we, we need to be more, m more imaginative and faster on our, uh, on our feet. And I, I, and I think social media is interesting. I sometimes worry that in social media, we're all just talking to each other. Mm -hmm. uh, we're not, uh, but, uh, and sometimes we are, but television is a unique driver of social media. Uh, I mean, just m last quote from the editor of Panorama who told me yesterday uh, that Undercover Care, which just went out without much publicity, started off with 2.5 million viewers Twitter went mad. By the end, the audience was 4.7 million as a function of it being talked about on Twitter. TV is a huge driver of uh, online conversations. And there's a lot of research in this area. And we in the NGO need community need to pay attention to that and do something. Thank you, Mark. Simon, you had something brief? Sorry. Just two very, very brief points. I guess one kind of looking at kind of what NGOs need to do, kind of need to lose the fear of talking to the public. The development rhetoric in the South, in developing countries, is ownership. We engage with communities because we want ownership. Why are we so frightened of engaging with British citizens back here? The rhetoric out there isn't then played through back here. And I think all the evidence shows that the, the British public can be very, very nuanced about some very controversial and complex subjects. Um, and that can help us learn as much as, as we can actually kind of gain from that. And the second thing I would say very quickly is kind of picking up on Lenny's point is NGOs have to stop seeing the next campaign, the next funding drive as a static thing. You're in a long-term relationship. We've, we've, I, I grew up, I guess, at the point of, um, of, uh, of Live Aid. And, uh, and nothing's changed. We're in it. We, uh, why not make this a dynamic thing and, and stop worrying about the individual campaign, the individual um, individual funding drive, and actually think about this as a 20-minute, a 20-year um, change, a strategic change in the conversation that we're going to have between, the not with, but between us and the British public. Thank you, Simon. I think that's an interesting kind of uh, point to pick up. The um, you know, if I'm sure there are people in the sorry, I'm sure there are people in the room who are working on the IF campaign. And um, if anyone has a comment about that who's actually working on the IF campaign, it would be quite interesting because um, if I didn't know the IF campaign was happening, I wouldn't know it from the media. Um, it really, you know, there, there, there's, a, there's a learning that, that maybe hasn't happened or... Anyway, there are questions. Uh, this gentleman has been very patient, um, <laughs> um, and uh, and and we'll take some more questions um, on the last round. If you could tell us who you are, uh, Carl Allen. I'm a member of the public. Uh, three questions: um, Is progress being made at a snail's pace? That's one. Two. Since we can't solve the problems of poverty in the developed world, what makes us think that 
we got to do anything effective in the developing world. And three, which I happen to forgot. <laughs> 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 Never mind. So okay. two questions. <laughs> two good questions. Um, any other? Oh, right, sorry. Got it. Okay. <laughs> um, as regards progress or lack of progress in dealing with poverty, is this a sort of, um, how do we know we are not in a Groundhog Day situation, which is a different situation from a snail's progress? Questions? No, it's not. I, I just don't agree with you. I think that progress in the, you know, not eradicating, but ameliorating conditions of the poor, it's never happened faster than in the past 20 years, where it, what may regrettably seem to be a sort of golden age of anti-poverty activity. And it's led, of course, by the Chinese Communist Party, which is the greatest machine for lifting people out of poverty in the history of mankind, you know? Um, one question there, and then I have a question from India. Um, I'm Tell us who you are. Um, I'm Katie Harris. I work for a project here at um, ODI called Development Progress, and it was just in response to that, to that last comment. Um, I'm, I'm working on a, a, a four-year project to explore uh, what's working in development and why, and try to draw out some of these stories of progress that have been happening across different sectors, across different countries in the world. And, and our experience is absolutely that we're living in an age where more progress has been made than at any other time in human history, and often we're not very good as a sector at telling those stories. Um, and so I just, yeah, just a little plug for our, for our project, but do go on to the Development Progress website uh, at developmentprogress.org if you're interested in seeing some of the case studies that we're, that we're bu building. Uh, we've already got 25 stories of progress up there. We're exploring another 25 over the coming couple of years. Thanks. Thank you. Um, there's take a liberty. The speed of change in past centuries should not be compared to the speed of change we should be achieving in this century. That's why I say it's a snail's progress. Thank you. There's a question from uh, India. This is where my blindness comes in. I can't actually see it very well. Um, Binu from India, um, do you think that popular perceptions and stereotypes of poverty are different in various countries, particularly developing and developed countries? How do you deal with people who are desensitized to poverty in countries like India, and you could argue in many ways the UK? Um, I think that's an interesting question. Do we have any other questions before? I turn to my panelists. Yes, one there. I am Bobby McDonald from the LSC. I just had a, a quick question. Um, what sort of evidence is there regarding the effects of the Y Poverty Series on support for aid and on the mechanisms that we expect to influence support for aid, such as perceptions of injustice, um, attributions of the causes of poverty, et cetera? Okay, and one last question back there, and um, we're going to wrap Victoria up. Victoria Bridges, Independent Producer Director. Um, I'm just curious about uh, the, with the democratization of the tools of uh, filmmaking, do, is there a trend towards everyone feeling that they're a filmmaker? And is there an issue amongst NGOs? Um, I'm not quite sure how to phrase this, but... Um, I guess it's, this, it's the sense that um, if there were more collaboration on the part of the NGOs with the people with the track record, what Nick's calling the good reporters, um, perhaps that would, you know, basically uh <laughs> improve the situation all around. Thank you. Um, can we start with you, Nick, and yeah, then we'll work sure. around. Um, so closing, closing words. The effects of white poverty, well, they're well known in Scandinavia, and we can supply you with the details, but it's not um, well known enough otherwise. Democratization of filmmaking, I, I, I think this is a very problematic area. I, th I think you have to focus on films that people actually want to watch, and the, a lot of the democratization of filmmaking is the same as the democratization of self-expression on the internet, is a lot of it is um, unreadable or unwatchable. So um, get things that actually appeal to people. I think that images of poverty in different countries are profoundly different. 
profoundly different. And I think here we have a lot to learn because we are, to some degree, and let's not exaggerate this, trapped in the 1960s school of shock advertising where you show skeletons, you show miserable people, and you say, bleed your heart out. And it just isn't like that at all. It, you know, as poor people are, uh, you know, whatever Hemingway said, you know, that... Um, and the famous conversation of Fitzgerald, you, you know, the, the poor are like us, only rather than the rich having more money, they have less money, but they, they, they are like, you know, they have similar lives, and I, I think you have to go in that direction, and that is the way in which all intelligent people working in this field are going, you know, about individuality, rights, discourse, but more important than that, actually looking at people's lives and what they can, what they can do with the potential in their lives. Everyone can get interested in that. Thank you, Nick. Sorry. Thanks. Um, I mean, just kind of picking up on your point, I th and, and, and poor people being like us or us like them, I think this goes to the point that if we don't address the, the, the notions of poverty back home as well as overseas, we're, do, it's a, we're setting up a them and us, and that, that in some way by giving money then that, that absolves all of, our, all of our sins, as it were, and, and, and it, it hides all of the complexity of the actions that we take and the things that we do that impact on poverty and impact on development. And this isn't just an academic debate because it, it does matter how we portray poverty and how we have a conversation with citizens and with each other and inside our institutions. Because if we think what the public want to see is starving babies being brought out of poverty and they want to see that starving baby going to school, and we don't tell the complexity of the story that gets that starving baby to school and gets that starving baby a meal, in order to tell the stories we think the public want to hear, we have to lie to ourselves internally in terms of how we understand what we're doing. Because to capture the information to tell the story we think we need to tell, we have to capture the wrong information so we can't learn. So this has real-world impact on the way that NGOs and DFID and aid agencies learn what works and what doesn't work. So it's really, the conversation itself is an important thing to allow us to learn. You can't learn unless you're being honest with yourself. And, and so we need an adult conversation where we tell ourselves the truth as much as we tell the public the truth, because then we can learn what works and doesn't work, doesn't work, and then we can actually deliver more effective aid. And that's why I think this conversation is so vitally important. The broadcast is really important for scaling up building understanding, but it has to be more than one way because that's just still the same old deficit model. We have to move to a conversation and there are ways that you can start to do it. I don't have the whole story, but I, I have part of the story of how you do it. Thank you very much, Simon. Mark, um, parting words? Yeah, I, I think it's really interesting that we have one independent producer in the room and, I don't, mm. uh, and, and one journalist slash academic and presumably the, the rest of the room is no other jour journalists uh, or TV producers. I think we, n we need to have a, this has been a very useful conversation, I think we need to have a conversation like this where there are more journalists and more broadcasters in the room. Uh, and I think the way Nick is talking is so different from the way most broadcasters, uh, he, he's really got under the skin of this issue and thought about uh, how to communicate it uh, and it's so different from most of the broadcasters who, who I meet just because uh, they're thinking about lots of other stuff. We need to sit them down in a room and get them interested and engaged and excited and show them that the more complex story is better television. It's more interesting than the simplistic story uh, and, and um, enthuse them uh, and uh, carry on a proper dialogue with them. And I'd love to see another event like this uh, you know, at, at Broadcasting House, where most of the room was uh, journalists and media folk, and we could, ha and we could have a real exchange of views. Um, th th there's, there's a sort of mistrust on both sides. Still, uh, surprisingly, uh, a lot of uh, journalists and media folk think NGOs don't get journalism. Uh, and they're too busy forcing their agenda on them. And similarly, the NGOs don't think that the journalists understand uh, the deeper problems or the impact of turning up with a film crew o o o on a community. And there's really a case for uh, building some trust and mutual understanding. Thank you, Nick. Lenny. 
Um, I mean, I think we've had a really good debate today, and 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 quite I'm kind of thankful for the fairly open comments and reflections that everyone has given about some of the challenges and tensions. I mean, I do think from the people that I talk to on these issues, there is this sense that perhaps we've presented this kind of aid model as pretty perfect, and it's no longer very convincing. Sort of convincing we talk to people in our own countries or in other countries. Um, and so I think we have to confront that head on. I mean, I, I also think that change is happening, um, and it is happening in lots of places around the world. Often aid is only a very small part of the story there, and that's what I think the development progress stories um, really well set out. They tell a story of how change happens, and it's not often an aid story. It's often about lots of things that have to come together, and, and sometimes about things that we in rich countries have to stop doing in relation to other countries, which I think this series, the Wild Poverty series, really nicely set out for, uh, for us from lots of different angles and looking at lots of different sort of facets to this interconnected um, relationship that we have. So I hope that we do see more of this in terms of the sorts of things we see on our televisions and the sorts of relationships between media, NGOs, and research organizations like ODI um, going forwards. I, I just want to say I'm deeply touched by it this morning, and it's fantastic. I had a wonderful time, and I echo what Mark says. We have to have more debates like this, because mm. it's really interesting. And I echo everything that's just been said. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> um, first of all, on the screen is um, the website for, it's the Why Poverty website. You can find all short and long films on that. Um, and some additional information. And then underneath, there's a link to further information, which um, uh, will be of interest, I think, to a lot of people in this room. Um, and I would like to thank the speakers and the audience, of course, um, here and uh, online in the ether. Um, I'd, but I'd like to thank the speakers for a very engaging um, uh, debate, I thought. and. Um, and also the ODI for hosting this. Um, uh, the event video and audio will be online within 48 hours if you want to watch it again, or if other people, you want to let other people know about it. So um, if you'd like to join me in thanking the panel. <laughs>